Did your kid dress up pee? Claudio, am I allowed to start? Okay. Stand up and pray real quick. <clears throat> in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, name one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you because you are a great God, Lord. You are a great God who provides just the best things for your children, Lord. We thank you for this morning. We thank you that we could celebrate it here together in person. We thank you for the opportunity that we may d dive into your word a little bit more. We thank you, Lord, because you are a God who intimately cares for every single one of us, Lord. You've given us these great windows into heaven. So, Lord, I ask that you be with us right now, Lord, as we look at one of these windows to know what, exactly what to expect when we leave these bodies, Lord. For, Lord, you've given us these things to encourage us, Lord, to correct us. So, Lord, I ask that, uh, that this be a message, Lord, that it speaks to us today, that your, your presence just fill this entire upper room right now, Lord, that we can't deny it. And I ask that you be glorified. I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy that I may deliver your word to your people. And I ask in session of all your saints and your tears, here as we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Kingdom that power and glory Amen. Okay, so. Brownie points for anyone who remembers what we're talking about. Anyone? Is it on the, okay, cool, I thought it might have been, all right, good, Reagan, I appreciate that. Yeah, so, are we okay? No, maybe. Should we try? I'm terrified. Okay. Test, 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 test. Oh, I'll just talk, and if it feedbacks, it feedbacks. Claudia will adjust. So, we started this thing a couple weeks ago. We decided that we were going to go through this book. It's called Orthodox Afterlife. It's this really cool book. Um, last week, we kind of took a high level. Actually, can, does anyone remember what the book is about? Actually, I'll just tell you. So, it's about Father Buchos, who was a monk, and he had this afterlife experience. And it was, um, it was this weird experience where, you know, he left his body. He kind of went... To this like this vast place then there was like this trial with like angels and demons and then christ showed up and then he made it to heaven and then what he experienced there and then right when he was like super excited to be there and to stay he came back to his body and he was like super bummed about it but then he repented short time later he died and i'm sure that's where he ended up uh, but it's this great story and the author john habib you know when he was reading or when he was reading this story and it was actually a handwritten letter from this monk um, he felt very kind of convicted because at that point he was what he considers himself to be kind of like a um, Christian by name only type of guy. And um, so he decided if this, if this is true, like this letter is a game changer, right? Like this should change the way that we totally live our lives and it should... And, and it should, it's just going to be a game changer. And he said, and if it's going to be true, it should be reconciled with other writings that happened at about the same time from other Orthodox Christians, you know, in the early church and like in later in the church. But if we're all Orthodox Christians, we all believe the same thing and we're all having after, um, afterlife experiences. Not we're all. <laughs> That's probably me. Uh, I'm taking, I'm taking so, eh. so um. He said, if we can look at these afterlife experiences and they all match, then there's validity to it. And the first thing I want to say um, was about this guy, John Habib. And it's not so much about John Habib. It's really more about you and I. Okay. Anyways. So, um... So about John Habib, and it's not so much about John Habib, this is more about like, you know, Peter, but when I think of something like this, I think about how often is there good soil? Because John Habib here in this story, he's good soil. Because how many people do you think have come across this letter before? It was actually, the more, when you research it, it's widely known, a lot of people read it, some people loved it, some people questioned it, some people denied it. But there was something about John Habib that made him good soil, okay? Because when the seed was planted, it bore fruit. And it's funny because a lot of the times I'll be in talks, okay? And, you know, the guy next to me, I can tell, is just totally eating it up. 
and he is just like all about it. And you can tell that this is like he's going through something like life changing. And I'm sitting there and I'm not getting anything, right? So what's the, what's the difference? The guy next to me is good soil, right? So because the good soil, when they receive the seed, bears fruit. You go to the parable of the sower, right? The, the sower was sowing out seed, right? And some bore 30, 60, and 100 fold. So was the difference in the seed? No. Same seed, same sower. That's, that was getting tossed out. What was the difference in the soil? So before we even get into this, I'm going to encourage all of you guys, be good soil. Like, good, be good soil not in this talk, but be good soil in every talk. Be good soil anywhere that you go. Have an open mind and open heart because a lot of the times, don't be the guy who gets robbed, that you are sitting there listening to something, anything from it, but the guy right next to you is having a life-changing experience that's bringing him closer to God. So, and that's the thing. I thought about that, and I was like, dude, this guy, not only did he you know, receive the word or the message that he got from this letter. He investigated it. He grew from it. He published a church. I mean, uh, he published a book that spread throughout the whole church. And now we're all learning from his fruit. Be good soil. So, so um, the last time we talked about this, we talked about the entire, like the entire story that Father Buchos experienced and what he saw. But now we're going to dive into a little bit deeper into the different parts of the story. So today we're going to dive into you know, death, what that means, okay, and the crossing over, and what that means, and the part of the story that honestly terrifies all of us, which is the part with the angels and the demons. So when it came to, when it came to death, Father Buchos had this crazy out-of-body experience, and it seemed, you know, at that point, he seemed to understand how, how small we are in everything that God is doing, everything that God possesses, everything that God has. Because um, when we have to understand that when we are confined to our body, like we are very, very limited. Like we think, and honestly, and it kind of sounds funny to say this, but we are naive enough to think that it's even all about us a lot, right? Where sometimes I'll just be driving and I'll like look over at the car next to me and I'll be like, wow, like, you know, so that guy in the car next to me is going to go home to his own family and in his, his family, there's going to be these kids and these kids, they go to school and they have their own relationship with their teachers and they have their own relationship with their friends and that guy's friend, he's going to go home and he's going to have a parent. And you start thinking about how big everything is and how really, really small that we are. And that's all within our body. But Father Buchos, his, his experience made it really, really real that everything was big. Right? It was so much bigger than can, we can even like, wrap our mind around. And the biggest aha moment was when we die, or when he died, when he was having his out-of-body uh, experience, he continued to live. So, so if you just wrap your mind around that, right? Like when he died, he continued to live. It changes everything. But then when you start looking at this and you, and, you, and you match it to the Bible, because that's where we always go, right? We always go to the Bible because it has to sync up to the Bible. And you go back and it's true because it says that we live as spirits. And this is confirmed by Christ himself in Mark 12, right? Where he's talking to the, I think he's talking to the Pharisees. He refers, he said, you know, God the Father said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then Christ adds on to the part. He says, um, he is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Right? So even Christ himself, when he's, he's addressing this, he's saying, look, when you guys see death, like you guys think that that's the end, like that's, that's like book over, but it's not. You keep living, right? Also in Mark 12, 25, it says, for when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are angels in, are like angels in heaven. So once the spirit passes from this world, it goes to another invisible realm and is set in one of two temporary places. Um, one place, you know, you, you could end up in Hades, where God forbid, I hope none of us end up there, or we can end up in paradise. Now, I'm, that's where I'm casting my lot. That's where, that's personally, that's where, that's where I want to be. Um, and once the spirit passes from the world, it goes, um, so, and that, and that is where, at the end of all of that, you know, we go through, this little thing with this little ordeal with like the angels and the devils to see where we're going to spend a little bit of time until Christ's final judgment, okay? Because fi Christ's ju final judgment only happens once. It's the last day, Matthew 25, 31 through 32, 
when the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the holy angels with him will sit at the, on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered um, before him. And he will separate them from one another as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. Because the thing is, is everyone who dies will go into like one of these temporary waiting rooms, and they're going to be waiting for Christ's second coming, right? And then Hades and paradise will be cleared. The final judgment will happen. Saint starts with an I. It's a really long name. I'm not going to kill it. Wrote, each class of those who have uh, died received a habitation as it is deserved even before the judgment, right? So the way that we live right now will deter determine where we go if, if we pass before, that, before the final judgment. And when it comes to the afterline accounts, the church has kind of put it into two major buckets, okay? Some actually die. Like, these are people who actually die. The spirits cross over, and at some point, the spirits will eventually come back into their body. So this will be like somebody who, like, flatlines or something like that. It seems to be dead, but then they end up just coming back to life somehow, okay? And then others, the second bucket, is while still in the body. So these are people who are still fully alive are granted the, oppor the opportunity to observe what happens after death, right? I think the church, what they call this is kind of funny because they describe it as ecstasy, not the drug, so <laughs> just ecstasy, and, um, or a divine vision. Now, who, who knows that somebody in the Bible who wrote about their divine vision? Any takers? No? You can go back a couple books. He wrote more than like half the New Testament? St. Paul. So St. Paul, because he, he, he writes this whole thing in 2 Corinthians where it says, whether in the body I do not know, whether in the spirit I do not know, was taken up into like the third heavens. Um, but that's an example of like the divine vision or the ecstasy. So in this book, John Habib started, uh, he came across this other account from an, um, from an Russian Orthodox man. Uh, his name also, I would kill it, so we're just going to call him Mr. Yu. Um, and, and his vision, obviously, the kind of the same thing that happened with Father Boutros's, it went through the church, you know, they kind of went through it, they kind of tested it, they saw if it was kind of valid, and the church openly accepted it, okay? And then even our own Abuna Makari Yunan uh, would talk about it and, and kind of confirmed it as well. And there's a lot of similarities between this story, between him and Father Boutros, which is what you're looking like, uh, it's what you're looking for when you want to validate something. If these people all experience the same thing in completely different times, in completely different locations, and they don't even know each other, they never, you know, talk to each other, they never, they've never communicated, well, then chances are that there's truth to that, right? So his story, we're going to run through a little of it. It says that this guy was in a hospital bed, he had pneumonia. And he said that it had progressed, breathing was hard, everything was hard, and it was a challenge for him. And, and he even acknowledges himself, he says that, you know, I could tell that this was pretty much looking grim right? In the hospital, constant care, people poking and prodding at him. Uh, and he speaks of the fact that he's, he's very alert. Like mentally, he is sharp. He can tell everything that's going on. But he's lacking in his capacity to perceive like the physical sensation of things, right? And he says like, for example, they're taking his pulse. He can't feel it, right? He sees them moving around. He sees them moving him, right? He can't feel it. And he, he, he references it, he's like, I am so deep within myself, like I'm so inside myself, that I, he felt removed from the physical world. And he says, and the doctors would ask him a question, he would hear the question, he would understand the question, but he did not feel that he needed to reply. Because there's no reason for him to even speak. Because he could tell, like, this is, it's out, like, I don't care anymore, right? Uh, and then he talks about this weird thing, and there, you're going to realize when you start looking at these afterlife experiences, there's these weird things, right, where you're like, I don't even understand what that means, but then when you look to the scripture, you can say, okay, I, I think I can tell what that means, where he says that he has this huge feeling like this magnet pulling him into the ground, right, like he's being very, very attracted to the ground, and he's like, now, I know, I'm in a hospital, I'm on like the fourth floor, you know, there's no ground, he's like, but I can just tell this immense freakish pull, and it's not normal, and it's not painful, and I don't understand it, but then you think about it biblically that it totally makes sense, right? Genesis 3.19, for thus you are 
into the dust you shall return. Also, Ecclesiastes 12, 17, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the, uh, and the, uh, and the spirit will return to, work, to God who gave it. Sorry. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. And it's crazy because you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense, right? But then you go back to these pages of scripture and it talks about how our flesh will go back to the earth. That's where it belongs. That's where it came from and that's where it will return to. Our spirit, on the other hand, will not. So the earth was kind of drawn him back in. And it was crazy because he says that at this point, he started seeing double. Um, when his spirit left his body, he was like hovering above it which is crazy when you start thinking about that, right? He says he saw the medical staff around him. He could tell the fact that they were working on him, right? And that stuff was not going well, and they were kind of frantic about it. And it says that he was so confused, right? Because he's staring at this bed. Um, and he's staring at himself in the bed, but he himself knew that he wasn't in the bed. So it totally, like, he was perplexed. He had no idea what was going on, right? There was another um, famous and Coptic Orthodox priest, Father Arsani, which is a very, very famous story. And it's also very consistent with his story that he wrote when he was in the, uh, the prison camp because he was the same thing, pneumonia in a prison camp. He says that he could tell that, you know, the mucus wasn't allowing him to breathe until he finally just kind of faded away. And then he was just like, the whole time I'm awake, but I feel this fade, okay? And then he was like, and then out of nowhere, I felt healthy and energetic. This is a guy who was dying on his deathbed, right? He said, and I stood. I stood next to the bunk that I was laying in. And I looked there, and there was a man, and the man was thin, tired, unshaven, right? He's, I looked around. I saw all my cellmates, all the other prisoners, right? Many of which he loved. And then it was at, only at that point that he looked at that thin, frail man, and he realized that he was looking at himself. And then he understood that somehow his soul left his body. His body was dead, but his soul was very, very much alive and even in better condition than it was when it was in that body. And it's crazy because they both describe it in the same way where it says that we're able to see them all, but we couldn't communicate, right? I couldn't talk to him. Um, Mr. Yu said there was a couple times where he's like hovering and he would do his best to, to try to kind of like touch the ground, but he, he couldn't, right? He said, there's a time where I approached one of the doctors so I could try to touch him and I would get my, I would be putting my hand as, you know, but no matter how, how much effort I put in, I, I couldn't get closer than a couple inches away, right? And, and it's crazy. And St. Augustine teaches us that when the soul is separated from the body, the man himself, even though he is in the body, sees himself even though he is only in his body, sees himself like his body. So he's basically saying, imagine this, that you're no longer in your body, so now you have your soul, okay? You have your soul. The soul looks like the body, but is not in the body. And that's the only way that you can kind of like recognize things. Um, and it's, it's validated again in the Gospels because the rich man recognizes Lazarus after his death. You guys remember that story? He can tell, hey, that's Lazarus. Well, how? Lazarus was not in his body. Well, the body, the body still takes resemblance, or the soul still takes resemblance of the body. You know, Mother Irini has shared three experiences. Tamava Irini, I'm sure you guys know her. Um, three experiences that support this. The first, there was a group of children who were part of a choir, and they died in an accident. And she saw them on their way to paradise. And she noticed each one of them. She recognized each one of them. And she said, the spirit had the form of the body of the flesh, but was shining and more beautiful. Right? She had another experience where she herself was taken to paradise. Um, this is the, the divine or the, or the ecstasy. And she went and she went to go see a departed nun whose name was Mother Irana, who told her, I am not in the body. I have abandoned it on earth. But it is true that the spirit takes the shape of the body, and that is why you can see me now. That's crazy, right? That's crazy. 
So that might be motivation for all of us to spend a little bit more time in the gym because even after we depart, right, like we're still carrying this, right? <laughs> At least maybe the glorified one's gonna look a little bit better. But the last one was when Mother Rini herself had an afterlife experience where she described the moment and she, you know, she died. She had a heart attack um, and the doctors were, were trying to resuscitate her and, and she prayed, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. And she said, I saw myself lying in bed and the spirit looking exactly uh, in the exact form of her body. Saying that's crazy. So Mr. Yu started wondering about this meaning of death. Like, what is this meaning of death? Like, when you look at the earthly meaning of death, it is drastically different than what we're reading about here. Right? It was everything he was watching, the doctors giving up, the fact that he wasn't in that body anymore, was that the language that we're all used to seeing as death? Like, at death, like, that's it, it's over? Like, we give up, we throw in the towel, there's no pulse, we're, we're done here, and we think that, well, that's it. That person's life, it's, 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 it's done. You know, it hit him when he looked back at that body, and that body, he literally looked at it, and he's like, it looked like a corpse, and you could tell there was no life in it. Like, that's just, that, that's what you can see. And he was so confused, so confused, saying, how could I be dead, but I still have not lost consciousness? I'm very alert, I'm very alive, I feel alive, how can this be death? And at that point, he realized that, you know what? My definition, or our definition of death must be wrong. Because by no means does it mean that it's something's over. It's just a transition. And then Mr. Yu starts experience, uh, experiencing what was referred to in the book as the crossover. You know, Father Buchos, we talked about this too when you went up there. And there's a certain point where you leave kind of the earthly and you go into this whole other realm. And he says, for his crossover, two angels appeared at his side. He recognized one right away, and he knew that this angel was his guardian angel. Didn't know how he knew it, but he knew it. The other one was unknown. The idea of the angel, uh, the angels accompanying us in this crossover is very well received in the Orthodox Church. It's documented, it's written about. Um, it's, you have so many, there's this monk uh, from, Mon uh, from Mount Athos named Father Maximos had the same exact experience. So when you start thinking about, you know, is this true, how this is playing out with all of these angels? Very true, right? Our orthodox belief is that the angels were created to serve God. And one of the purposes of those angels is to minister to humans, right? To minister to mankind. And the concept of the guardian angel has also been widely accepted and then also documented about, written about within the church and the church fathers and no shortage of them. You know, you got St. Ambrose, St. Gregory of Nicaea, St. Uh, St. Shnuda, all of these church fathers have written about this, this concept of this guardian angel. Uh, again, Tama Varini, this is a beautiful story. If you don't believe about guardian angels, explain this one to me, right? She would actually interact with her guardian angel. Before she was the head of the convent, um, she would wake up for prayers and uh, midnight praises before she would start her very, very long day. And her day consisted of waking up at about 4 a.m., and she would, she would stay up working until probably about 11 p.m. And she was always worried about her exhaustion. And she says, I do not want my exhaustion to prevent me from waking up early and praying. So she started to pray. God, would you multiply my hour of sleep? Multiply my hour of sleep. That's a great prayer for any parent, right? <laughs> so <laughs> multiply my hour of sleep. And she said, let my four to five hours of sleep actually be as if they were eight to nine. Okay? And then the, the, the thing about the monastery or the, the, the convent that where she was living, every nun was on their own. They had no system to wake up the nuns, right? Each one had to depend on themselves. There was no alarm. There was no bell that was rung in the morning. Um, but the Lord heard her prayer. And not only did he hear her prayer, but he allowed her to hear a voice every day that would wake her up saying, Irini, Irini, wake up and pray. Every day. So she, she said that she would wake up, she would, open, she would hear the voice, she would wake up, open her eyes, and then she would see an angel standing by her head. Okay? She would sit up, the angel would move to the foot of her bed, 
and then the angel would disappear. She said that that encouragement from God every day, sending her guardian angel to wake her up, that she would wake up with great joy and never feel tired, right? The angel would wake her up every day, same time, same way, and she thanked him every time. One time she asked, who are you? And the angel responded, I am your guardian angel who accompanies you all the time, right? That should be so comforting for us to know that we have a guardian angel who is accompanying us all the time. Another beautiful story of Pope Carolos. He was praying Vespers in a church and he was sensing the altar. So he sensed the altar three times. He comes out of the altar the three times. He starts sensing the church. And a five-year-old boy is like walking behind him, okay? And he's walking right behind him. And he's got his arms up, you know, like, like he's just almost like he's trying to like hug, hug like Pope Carolos from behind. And, um, of course, you know, you can imagine what all the parents do, right? What the parents do? Kid, get back. What are you doing? Leave him alone. Like, <laughs> get out of the procession. This, that, whatever, right? Um, so all of the kids told him to stop. His holiness said, no, 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 no. Guys, just let him receive the blessing. Let him receive the blessing. So at the end of Vespers, they go up to the kid, and they're like, hey, what's the deal? Right? Like, you can't do that. <laughs> and the child's response was, I was just walking behind the angel that was walking behind Pope Carolos so I can touch his beautiful wings. Right? So you start thinking of this fact that like we all, like we are surrounded by angels, surrounded by angels. And, and it's crazy. And I know a lot of the times we think that when we die, um, you know, we just wake up in this other place. And I, I wish that that was the case, but it seems as if there is some sort of crossover realm that we have to pass by. And the saving grace in that or the comforting fact in that is the angels are the ones who are there to guide us and to show us the way. Right? So at this point, Mr. Yu, who is uh, uh, the Russian Orthodox guy, um, was taken to this vast place. And he said that this place was so vast. He's like, I've never experienced anything so vast in my life. Like a drop in the ocean would be considered too big to, to describe what he was feeling in this vast area of darkness. Right? He also said that it's weird because now he's starting to realize the difference between the soul and the body because he's in this vast, dark place. And, he's, uh, and though, though it's vast, it's huge. I am nothing in comparison to it. It's dark. It's black everywhere, but I can still see. So he's got like this, this, this thing where he's starting to realize the difference between his physical limitations. But he can see clearly in the dark. But it was just another reminder of how vast everything was and how small he was. And here's the other part that was not very comforting in Father Buchos' story either, because when you get to this crossover part, you have the angels there. Well, what's on the other side of angels, right? Like, what's the other end of that spectrum? You have the evil spirits, and you have the demons. <laughs> and that's what came next, right? And he says that the evil spirits showed up, and he said that at that point, I have felt, I had felt more horror than I have ever experienced in my life. And he was terrified. They surrounded him on all sides. They were yelling at him. They were demanding that the angels gave him over. Right? They were doing everything they can to, to take them from the angels and trying to seize them from the angels, but they did not dare even approach the angels or to come into contact with the angels. And they were spewing out things like, he is ours. He is a sinner. He has renounced God. Right? And they started accusing him. And, and he wanted to deny it. He wanted to yell back that it's not true. No, not me. Right? But he says at this time he was flooded with memories of everything that they were saying, right? Childhood memories, even, of things that they were saying. And he says, and all of these things come, came to mind, and my tongue froze. I had no defense. What was I going to say, right? Something so vague. He said, I was, I was having memories that were so long ago and so insignificant that there is no way these things would have ever come to mind otherwise, right? This must also be a part of the soul, because I was not limited by, by, by my physical memory, but I remembered everything clearly. And it says that he started praying. He started appealing to the saints. And he was appealing to the saints. He said it did not frighten the demons at all. It did not slow them down at all. They were still coming very aggressively at him, right? And he says at that point, he questioned even his own Christianity. He says at this point, I can say that I'm a Christian only by name. And it was the first time in his life that he called out to the intercession of the one who intercedes for the most. And he called out to St. Mary. And he said the second he called out to St. Mary and the second he interceded for St. Mary, there was this white mist that came out 
and it hid them from the eyes. Uh, it hid them from their eyes, and they withdrew. He said, "I could still hear the attacks, but they were getting further and further away." Right? He realized that at that point they were moving on and they were going upward. But here's something that I want us to think about when it comes to these evil spirits. Like, no one likes evil spirits at all. Okay? And actually, think about it. Evil spirits keep us up at night sometimes, right? Have you ever been around somebody and they start telling uh, scary stories or just, you know, exorcisms and all this other stuff? You just go, oh, like, I can't, I can't even sleep after that, right? I um, mean, it keeps us up. Um, but the protection from the evil, evil spirits is something that's very well written about in our church, right? The idea that even when our departure is at hand, that we are, we are protected by the angels, you know, and they are the ones who are protecting us during our crossover. Very, very, uh, very common. It's found in our funeral prayers. It's found in the Egbeya. It's one of the things that we ask St. Mary to protect us from. And it's funny because even though that, like, you know, we read that in the Egbeya, we don't even think twice about it, right? We think that this is just a nice prayer. But Mr. Yu here, he, when he called on St. Mary, immediately it paid off. Immediately. There's power in that. And the invisible struggle between angels and devils during our life become much more real after death. Like right now, it's happening. It's happening to every single one of us here that there is a fight for our soul. But we just don't see it. But it will become crystal clear after our death. Um, there's this beautiful story of St. Anthony who was preparing to eat, and he stood up to pray before his meal. He said it was about the ninth hour, and, he was being, and then he was taken up in the spirit. As he stood... Same thing, he was able to see himself. Okay, so he's out of his body. And he says, then they were, they were being taken up and they were stopped by evil spirits. Now keep in mind, he was being accompanied by angels, right? But he was stopped by these evil spirits. And the evil spirits were, were not allowing him to pass. They demanded that he couldn't go anywhere because he was a sinner. And they started accusing him. And the accusations went back to St. Anthony's birth. And I love this part, right? Because it says they're accusing him from his birth, but the angel interrupted. And he says, As for these things, the Lord has erased them. But as for the time he became a monk and promised himself to God, he can take an account. So he's basically saying, any of that early stuff, it's gone. You can't, you can't, you can't even say anything about it. That was before. Now, what Bible verse uh, supports this? 2 Corinthians 5.17, anyone who comes to Christ is a new creation. Right? So he's basically, all the past things have become old. So basically, you got the, the angels here, I mean, you got the demons here who are trying to attack him on his past life. And the angels say, no, 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 that's, that's, that's all that's passed away. But from when he made his commitment to Christ, anything after that is fair game. Go for it. Comforting? Convicting, right? <laughs> Comforting that, like, you know, okay, cool, he can't get me, like, before that. But do we all remember the time where we accepted Christ, right? And we became a true follower? Anything after that's fair game? Anything after that? And this is the part where God blessed St. Anthony. Because it says they, they brought accusation after accusation against him, but they could not prove it. They couldn't prove it, right? Where would you fall in that? Where would I fall in that? I will tell you, you'd be able to prove it. You'd be able to prove it, right? But it's very, very convicting. But then after they couldn't prove it with St. Anthony, they cleared the way for him to pass, and he came to his body again. And at that point, you think he cared about the food? No, he did not care about the food. And he ended up staying the night in prayer and praises, right? He was taken back by the battle for good and evil for him, right? They were arguing for him. You know, St. John of the latter tells the story of this fellow monk before his death, right? And it says before he died, he went into the state of ecstasy, right? So he was mentally there, his eyes were open, but he was physically gone, right? Um, and he says, and what was concerning was what we were seeing, because he had some of the other monks around him. Um, and it says it, it seemed as if like this, this monk was standing trial. And he was saying things like, yes, I did that. But that's why I fasted so much. Right? That's why, that's why I did these works, you know? Yes, yes, I, I, I did that, but I wept. I wept with repentance for it. 
You know, yeah, I, I did that, but then I, I also served my brethren, right? And at many times, he said the words that were uttered were, yes, I do not know what to say to that. But I know that, that with God there is mercy, right? And St. John of the Latter says that he was looking at this monk, and he was taken back, because this wasn't just a regular monk. This was a holy monk. This was a great monk. This has been a monk who had been a monk for 40 years, and he was well known to be given the gift of weeping with repent or uh, repentance with weeping because that's the type of monk that this man was. And he was held accountable for all of the things that he did. And he said that even by what he was uttering, he was being held accountable for the things that he did not do as well. And it's, it's a sobering fact that everyone will face this day. You know, there was something that was written so beautifully, I just wrote it word for word. It says, if we neglect to enjoy a life with Christ, if we neglect to enjoy a life with Christ, then you will experience Hades. Think about that. It's not that you're choosing something else, you know. It's not that we're turning our back on him. We are neglecting to live, to enjoy a life with Christ. You will experience Hades. But for those who know and love God, follow his commandments, we will enter into paradise. You know, in Galatians 6, 7, and 8, there's this great verse that says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows of the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. We will not mock God. So, each one of us will face this point at one or another, and no one will escape. Those who choose darkness, they will be on their own right? It's, it's of their free will that they go ahead and they choose darkness on their own will now, but they will be dragged into darkness against their will later. So I'm going to leave you guys at a cliffhanger. So I'm not going to tell you what happens next, okay? As a matter of fact, I'm not even going to tell you what happens next. Mark will tell you what happens next because Mark will be here to give next week. And, um, but honestly, if you guys have not picked up this book, I encourage you guys to pick it up and to read it. It is a great book. It's an easy read as well. Um, I would encourage you guys to do what I did, which was, you know, I skipped to the back and read the letter first because it, it added a lot of, like, context to everything that we're going to be going through, and it's a great story, and then it allows you to kind of get down into it a little bit more as, uh, as the details go on. Cool. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, and when I, when I read this story, it just reminds me, Lord, about how much... You fight for us, Lord, but how much the tricks of the devil are out there to stumble us as well, Lord, and, and that we're kind of caught in the middle. But, Lord, we know that, that Satan, he is the father of lies. He is a deceiver. So I ask, Lord, that you just, that you bring truth to that, Lord. And truly, we do need to enjoy a life with you. Life with you is nothing but enjoyable, Lord. You're the one that gives us peace. You're the one that gives us satisfaction. You're the one that gives us just everything that we need, Lord complete contentment. So don't allow us to be distracted by the things that are shiny and the things that look really nice at the time, Lord, because we know that it's all fake, but Lord, you are the one that we will spend eternity with. So Lord, I ask that you, uh, that you bless this group of people here, Lord. I ask that you make this week a great week for us. I ask that your hand be evident in that week, Lord. Lord, I ask that you a lot, give us eyes to see our guardian angels this week, Lord, and the fact that they are there opening doors for us, Lord, and protecting us. Lord, I also ask that you open our eyes to the, to the evil one, Lord, and the tricks that he's setting before us, that we don't fall into those either, Lord. But ultimately, let this be a week, Lord, that we grow deeper and deeper in love with you, Lord, and we give you more of our time, more of our attention, and everything else, Lord. And I ask the session of all your saints and martyrs. Here's we pray with one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Christ, we shall Lord, by the kingdom and the power and the glory.